certainly some other people that straggle in here as we go. Um, uh, just a real quick our, about our, our format and what we do. And um, we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, my mom's son here today. And we're going to uh, take him through a series of questions and then we'll open it up towards the end for uh, any kind of comments or questions. Hopefully everybody's got a bottle of uh, Keenan that they're able to enjoy this afternoon and uh, uh, have a good happy hour with us. So today is a great day for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, long Memorial Day weekend. Uh, spring is in the air for most of us. Uh, but the biggest reason for my happiness today has absolutely nothing to do with uh, the long weekend or anything. We have, it, it has to do with the fact that I have two very special guests here. Um, and they're here to discuss what really is, without question, one of the most treasured and storied vineyards and wineries in the world, certainly in the United States, California, and Napa. Um, and with the purchase of land in 1974, about 1,700 feet above sea level on Spring Mountain in St. Helena, California, of the famed Napa Valley, Robert Keenan, Michael's father and Riley's grandfather, uh, started one of the most important wine businesses in Napa Valley. And when I say that, it's not hyperbole, and I'm going to get into uh, why I think that, and we're going to we're going to talk with them. So, it's an honor and a privilege and an absolute joy to welcome Michael and his son Riley to our broadcast today. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks for putting this together. Yeah. yeah. So, um, we'll get into the family business and uh, many of the aspects of it that we can uh, cover in an hour here. But first, uh, we, we talked a little bit about this. Everything is okay with uh, the winery and and uh, with all the mess that's going on in the world and. You guys, everything you guys have, have managed well, and you're looking forward to the future. Yeah, I mean, right now we are doing just fine. Uh, we were able to switch gears at the beginning of this COVID shutdown and uh, go to our mailing list and uh, appeal to their wallets, and uh, it's been a well received and but quite a shocking change. I mean, we have a pretty developed, or we had a pretty developed distribution system throughout the United States. Um, which we had great relationships with our distributors, with our brokers. Um, some I've known for 20 years, some for 15 years, some for 10 years. Um, and in each market we worked in, we did do a lot of work with um, restaurants and country clubs. So it was just amazing to see that market channel just disappear literally overnight on uh, March 17th, both here in California and in the other 49 states. And it was just a shocking the most shocking rapid change of market conditions I've ever seen. Right. Um, I know that the two of you are out there and traveling a great deal. Are you guys itching to get back out on the road and get it started? Cause I, you know, I think we all agree this is going to last forever. It's going to end um, at some point, but uh, I, I know that uh, Michael, for example, I know you, I actually don't know anybody that travels or works more than you do. Are you, uh, are you got some cabin fever? Are you ready to get back out there? No, I've adjusted to my new station in life quite nicely. <laughs> That's funny. No more traveling. Done with airplanes. I actually, I wonder if anybody's going to be getting on a lot of airplanes the rest of the year. It'll be interesting to see for sure. We do live in one of the nicest places on earth. And it's, uh, I've gotten quite used to being here every day. Right. Like I've literally never enjoyed this property more than I have over the last seven weeks. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's good and bad and everything. There's winners and losers and everything. And I think uh, through this, you know, that's probably what you're, you're, you're enjoying the good and you're not seeing the bad. Um, I'll get into uh, some of the, the tactics you've taken, which I think have been some of the most genius in the entire industry, but uh, we'll do that in a minute. But um, first thing, I want to know for uh, for I want everybody to hear from you. Um, tell us a little bit about you, how the uh, the vineyard and the winery got started, and how long have you guys been doing this? It's been a while. It's been a long time. Well, I think you mentioned uh, Dad bought the property in 1974, and that was roughly 22 years after he married my mother, and was introduced to the fine wines of Burgundy and Bordeaux by his new father-in-law. And after collecting these wines and enjoying them and teaching us about them as kids, he got the bug to go to Napa to look for property to start, in his mind, a first growth, uh, you know, family run estate winery, a la, you know, Latour, Margot. He was very competitive and wanted to be the best. And he thought that uh, in the mountains of Napa is the place where he was going to be able to find property that would make the wines that would be the equal of those top five chateaus. And he really thought the valley was beautiful, 
could grow anything there, but he didn't think the wines were great in that first growth sense of great. They didn't have the power, they didn't have the longevity, um, the complexity, uh, the nuance that the first growth did. They were beautiful, they were very tasty, very well perfumed and textured, but uh, they truly didn't have what he thought was the great DNA that the mountains would give. And after 40, what are we on, our 43rd growing season? Actually, probably, it's our 43rd vintage coming up, but we planted in 75, so this is our 46th growing season. And I, I think Dad's original vision is, is starting to really play out. We are making wines that have the depth, the complexity, the nuance, the, the power, and the longevity to represent, I think, first growth quality status. And I think Dad, well, before Dad died, he did say he was actually very proud, and he'd certainly be thrilled with what we're doing today. And just as a note of what we did today, we tasted 2019 Merlots, estate Merlots, Cabernets, and Cab Francs off the estate uh, to put together a blend for our open house, which usually would be Father's Day weekend. And it's just, it was just so, we don't talk about it much now because we're sort of starting to take it for granted in a way, but the textures of those one-year-old wines um, is just so good. And it took us a long time to get to that place where we could make Cabernet Sauvignon that could show such great texture and expression, you know, out of barrel. Um, I, I used to talk about a lot more 20 years ago when we were just really starting to fine tune our vineyard techniques and our cellar techniques to make the, the change from making the wines that dad made that were pretty, pretty intense and pretty tannic and a little rough around the edges to the, to the wines that still have that same level of power and expression, but are just so much more polished now. Right. You know, um, I, I I, I know, Michael, you and I have talked about this many, many, many times. Uh, I, I, when I go down into my cellar and pull uh, an old bottle of uh, Keenan versus an old bottle of Napa, almost without exception, the Keenan is drinking better. You know, it, it's a, I'm, you know, occasionally you get one of those uh, old bottles of Bordeaux that just really, really sings to you, but it's, it's not as often as you might think, especially with the, the money that they cost. So, but uh First vintage was 77. Tell me a little bit about that vintage. How many cases, what varietal was it? Do you remember the, the retail price by any chance? Well, no, because I, I worked the first harvest with dad. So my memories are all about harvest. And in fact, I was thinking about that today. And one of, one of my <laughs> enduring memories is for some reason, I was the one who drove all the grapes up Spring Mountain in our old uh, Ford, probably 73 pickup. And uh, while well, dad, you know, barked at me, you know, turn, go faster, do this, do that or whatever. For some reason, he made me drive, and, and that vintage was all with purchased fruit because the stuff we planted in '75 wasn't bearing fruit yet. So we picked up fruit, and you know, from from Buena Vista, from uh, from BV, from Camus, um, and that was my intro to the valley. Was driving down there you know, with Dad with our our trailer and picking up fruit, and and then hauling up the mountain, which was a, a harrowing experience, but. Uh, we, we did, I can tell you what we made. We made Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Pinot Noir that year. And mm -hmm. I didn't make Merlot until the next year, and only Pinot for two years. <clears throat> and the Pinot was from our neighbor, uh, the Smiths uh, Vineyard. For some reason, they were too afraid to make it, and uh, they gave it all to us. And we made Pinot for two years. Hmm. Interesting. That, that so, showing spectacularly right now. The, uh, the, the 77s are showing spectacularly? Oh, wow. Especially the, at a Magnum, well, the Pinot, Pinot's the rarest wine that we have ever made, but the 77 cabs at a Magnum or bigger are, are still really fresh. And I think the retail price for the 77 was $8.99. So we had some friends come up here with uh, a five bottle vertical of our original vintages, and one of them still had the original price tag from a retail shop called The Red Carpet down in Southern California, in LA. And they had it tagged $8.99, and, and they had a date when they put it on, August 27th. And then five days later, they panicked and slashed it by 20% and slapped another sticker on it, six ninety nine, dollars right below it, and put it on the bell rack in probably 1981. So it was uh, below 10 bucks. But just, just by coincidence, I think it was last October, I was in Oklahoma City, or in Tulsa, and one of the psalm, one of the chief psalms in the city there had been guarding the 77 Pinot Noir waiting for the right night to share it with me when I was in town. And I think the same week, Riley got a bottle from, where'd you get yours from? I took it from you. Good, good answer, yeah. <laughs> and we, we drank it with, you know, within a day or two of each other that we couldn't wait to tell each other you know, how, how great it was. Because I've had that wine a number of times over the years. And it, it tasted better last October in 2019 at the age of 42 
than it ever did. I've, I've never had a Pinot quite like it, and I, I don't spend a lot of money on, on Burgundy, but uh, it was really special. I, I, the only reason I stole it from my dad is because I assumed that all that wine was bad, uh, given that we don't make it anymore, and so I just thought it'd be interesting to see how, how it was. And as soon as I stuck my nose in the glass, because uh, my parents were out of town when I took it, uh, as soon as I put my nose in the glass, I knew I'd fucked up uh, because it was a real wine. It was really good. So, uh, so first you broke into the house. Yeah, I broke into the house. <laughs> Helped yourself to the kitchen, the bar. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. And, and the wine cellar. And the wine cellar. Yeah. And then I used your television. Yeah. It is fun when I got to tell you, when these guys come into town and they work together, it's, it's, it's a lot more than just about wine. It's a lot of fun. So you, you definitely want to check it out if you can. So... Let's talk a little bit about the varietals you're growing. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're growing for starters and, uh, you know, maybe a little background as to why. Well, dad's original vision was Cabernet Sauvignon. He wanted to be left bank, you know, first growth. So the majority of the vines planted in the 70s uh, were Cabernet Sauvignon. And then uh, in addition, we planted a small amount of Merlot and Cabernet Franc uh, to be used as blending tools, never imagining we'd be making either one as a standalone varietal. And then like everybody else in the valley, we, we planted Chardonnay for cash flow. And I remember when I came back um, in 98 to run the program after dad kind of handed it over to me, I, I was sort of thinking through the lens of what I've been taught, you know, by him at a young age, which is all about terroir and you, you grow certain things because they really thrive there. And in Europe, they've figured this out over the course of a thousand years. And I thought, why on earth would be growing a red from Bordeaux and a white from Burgundy. We should, if we're a Bordeaux area, we should be growing Sauvignon Blanc. And 98 was the first harvest off the replanted Chardonnay vineyard. I thought, well, before I rip it out, I should at least wait to see <laughs> when the vineyard hits maturity to see how good the fruit is. And now we're, uh, the Chardonnay's still there. It's like I can barely see it through the crack in the cellar door. It's right in front of the winery, six acres. And it's, it's now, this is its 26th uh, leaf this year. And uh, that vineyard shows no signs of slowing down. It's, it's really a freakish vineyard. And we, aside from last year, we had to water it because we had to replant um, about a sixth of it because of uh, Pierce's disease. We hadn't watered it for the 19 years prior to that. So mountain setting, dry farm Chardonnay is one of the rarest things in Napa you'll come across these days. Other than mountain Menthea. Say that for later. Oh, yes. Yeah, next question. <laughs> so we, we always have been focusing on the three, those three board over idols and Chardonnay primarily until um, 1998 when I came back and then I planted Zinfandel and Alicante and Carignan to make a, uh, you know, mountain field blend, sort of an honor of what our history is here because um, we are one of the, uh, the ghost wineries of Napa. Uh, this winery that we're sitting in, the cellar was originally built in 1904 by Peter Conradi and we think the wine they made was... Um, an estate field blend of primarily Zin with Alicante, Boucher, and Carignan. So we planted those three, um, mostly Zin, in honor of what the history was here. And I think that program is, has turned out, now that those vines are mature, we planted another two and a half acres in 2007, um, a warmer site that's been really successful. And I think our, our Zin is just a great example of a unique expression of terroir that nobody else is doing. Um, and it's, you know, it's $40 a bottle it's, and you can age it for 20 years. It's, it's just right. phenomenal. So you picked all those things. At, why not Viognier or Tempranillo or something like that? You, your family were trailblazers for sure. Um, and you chose not to trailblaze with anything like that, but for, and that was mostly because of your dad, right? Or did you ever consider trying some of the other, um, for lack of better words, off varietals that uh, aren't typically grown in California. If Americans consider drinking them, we consider growing them. <laughs> but again, the, the, it's really important to know the history of, of what happened here. When I came back in 98, this was a, a, a stressed situation. The winery was not doing well at all. And we had just finished replanting, I think, 42 out of 47 acres. So my job was really to just... <laughs> spend as little money as possible, try to restore the sales company, um, figure out the winemaking protocols and, and, and bring the program back to uh, where it should be. So at that point, there's really no thought of experimentation. It's all about execution and right. reestablishing yourself as a viable player. But you're, you're leading into what's actually happening 
right now, and that is now that we've really righted the ship and we're doing quite well, and also with the addition of Riley bringing in you know young blood and new ideas, we now have the ability to experiment. And uh, I'll let Riley uh, finish the story. He's made a couple of choices based on stuff that he's been excited about. Uh, and, and by him getting excited about it, he got me excited about it, so. Yeah, so we, um... We had a, a small block of Merlot that was essentially the buffer between the, the Chardonnay vineyard and then our, our mailbox vineyard where we do our single vineyard Merlot. And we call it the Merlot flat. And it was uh, a, comp- a subcomponent that was always folded into the larger Napa Merlot that we do. And it was never something that really stood on its own. It wasn't of particular interest as far as the Merlot that we make. And it was always kind of first on the chopping block if we were ever to get rid of something to make room for grapes uh, that we didn't grow. So in 2017, we marked the last harvest of that block of Merlot um, and and then got rid of it and then replanted it three different grapes um, in basically equal parts, about a third of an acre each um, of uh, Petit Verdot, which is obviously uh, one of the, one of the uh, noble Bordeaux varietals, but it's one that we've never grown before and it's something that we're excited to use probably as a subcomponent for our reserve cab and other Cabernet expressions. I, I don't anticipate that we'll be doing anything with that on its own. Um, and then the other two grapes um, are really where the, the experimentation is, is, gonna, is gonna play out. And, and uh, the, the first is Mouved um, or Mutaro, as I think Van, you've made the case, as, as, as we should be referring to it as. Um, but this is obviously a grape that's native to, to uh, predominantly Spain, but it's getting most of its profile from Southern France, Provence, uh, Bandol, Obviously, the, the rosé that comes out of there is, is probably the most world-famous rosé I can think of. Um, so there's a thousand different things that we can do with it, um, just depending on what kind of fruit we, we see um, once it starts producing, which we're probably a couple years away from um, anyway. This is such a slow process, and this is my first really hands-on experience of going from seed to bottle and, and really having to exercise some patience. Um, and then the last grape after the Mouved um, is M- Menthea, which is, which is a very much a new thing for Napa. As far as we know, according to most of the farming reports we've checked and, and all of our friends in the valley, no one grows Menthea in, in Napa. And I only know of one other uh, grower in all of California, um, and by extension, all of, the, uh, of America. So this is, this is a brand new grape for us, brand new grape for the valley really brand new for California. Um, this is really a Spanish grape variety native to North, Northwestern Spain. Um, the, two, uh, the two counties are Provence, uh, I don't know what they call them there. Area. Areas, administration zones um, is, uh, is uh, Galicia and uh, Castilla and Leon is the, your two um, sort of Northwestern corner areas of Spain where it grows. Bierzo and Ribera, da, Ribera, 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 Ribera. Ribera Sacra is your two sort of hot zones for, for Bierzo or for Menthea. Um, traditionally, this is a grape that uh, originally people, are th- I think the Romans were cultivating over there um, before they got kicked out. Um, so it's very traditional. Mostly it's grown on the valley floor where it kind of makes this lighter pink, easy drinking table wine style. But more recently, um, usually as a result of a guy named uh, Raul Perez and his ilk up there, they've really sort of put, uh, moved forward this sort of style of mountain and the uh, high elevation, vertiginous, high stress, um, building structure, ageability, everything that we do here already um, folds in perfectly for, for this new style of Menthea that's gotten really popular, especially among, amongst the sommeliers. Um, it's definitely sort of has that geek factor going on, um, which I think is exciting and, and will make it pretty easy to get people excited about it, especially because we're probably the only making it couple barrels um and again we're probably three or four years away from that um coming to fruition so it's just it's just speculation at this point that's awesome so is it fair to say that you guys are guided more by sense of place and uh in your viticulture than anything else is sense of place really one of the, the most important part of you know parts of what you're doing yeah it's sort of the foundation rock behind what my father taught me and what he believed in choosing this property is that uh, there's a magic to terroir. Some areas are better than others. I mean, that's why you have such a, again, back to Europe, which is the template, why you have, you know, Grand Cru, Grand Cru Classe, you have all these different classifications for vineyards in a relatively small area because they've found out that, you know, a little higher up in elevation, this is the best, and it changes when you get down here where the soil becomes more, whatever, level more, more loamy or whatever it is. So yeah, there's a belief that certain properties have magic uh, and for certain varietals. And I think uh, 
you know, Merlot being my personal favorite subject, I think this is one of the best Merlot areas, uh, not only in Napa, but in the world. I think we make absolutely world-class Merlot here. That is uh, go up against anybody's Merlot. Yeah, I, I totally agree. To, to your knowledge, are, are there many people, I mean, I, I think the breed that you guys are, what you're doing is, is not the norm. Is there, are there very many other people in Napa Valley doing things the way you do things where, you know, the, it's a sense of place and, and trying to do the right thing and not taking the shortcuts? Is that, you see very much of that anymore? Yeah, yes, before you answer. Yes, it's just, it's harder to find. Those wineries are getting smaller and smaller. A lot of them are going directly to mailing lists. They certainly don't show up or have the opportunity to make the volume where you'll see them in restaurants frequently or you'll see them in retail. Um, I, I think we're so, with our size, it's, it's, we're so lucky that we got the 47 acres that we got when we got it um, because it allows us to push enough volume to where it leaks out and people are able to see it in other places that aren't just our winery. Um, but going back to your original question, yes, there are still a lot of wineries that do what we do. They just tend to be much smaller. Um, uh, and, and as a result, much more exclusive, harder to get into and much more expensive. Um, right. Generally speaking. And I, I think it's safe to say that the number of those wineries is, is slowly diminishing. And the trend in Napa is for small guys like that to sell out for either a generational reason or a financial reason. And it's usually bought by a larger entity and the, uh, you know, the driving culture disappears with the change of ownership. Um, so in Napa in general, you see just more corporate ownership of vineyards, more corporate ownership of, of labels and uh, sort of an homogenization of the Napa ethos because of the corporatization of, of what's going on. And, you know, that brings me to a, a point that I wanted to ask you about. You guys don't do anything necessarily by um, spreadsheets and, you know, accountants and stuff like that. You simply use accountants and spreadsheets as a scorecard was that would that be fair to say well yeah i mean it's easier just to be direct and say that we do what we do because we think it's the best way to go about doing our business and if we execute it well we're always going to find a market we're never going to be you know a trendy topic we're never going to be of course new again because we're now old uh, we're never going to be a fad chaser but we're always going to deliver something that's incredibly authentic something that has ageability something's going to pair with food something you can be really proud of and it's going to be well priced. And if we execute that properly and have a decent sales distribution network, we're always going to make a living. I'm not worried about that. But my, my driving vision is, is really the art of making great wine and really respecting uh, this land that I've been given the privilege to, you know, be the shepherd of as the second generation. And I think Riley's picked up on that. Um, those values a hundred percent. If somebody we had uh, I can't what's his name Ian Cobble, Master Somalia was here about a year and a half ago, and he go he asked me he goes so what do you think's different about your your style of winemaking than your dad's? And I didn't even have to think about it. I said my style isn't any different at all. We just got better at execution mm -hmm. and better at growing. So the wines are they're just better at being what we've always wanted them to be, and that's better texture, better expression, uh, more refined tannins you know, more natural perfume, better vineyard health, uh, and more of a sustainable long-term approach. I and mean, I'm really proud to point out that that 26 year old Chardonnay vineyard is just healthy as a teenager. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. I know, I know some winemakers who think, well, when it gets to 20, you know, we got to start. And again, this is the, the corporate way of thinking when the vineyard gets to be 20, we got to pull it out because yields are going to start to go down and, uh, you know, we got to keep the young stuff coming. Right. Right. Yeah, there's no question you guys lead the pack in authenticity. I, that's a, a really important theme that, that, uh, that I think I want to always drive back to for uh, anybody that will be checking this out later on YouTube and everything else. It's Keenan wines are authentic. And, and that is something that I don't think uh, is as prevalent as it used to be. And so that's really, really, really important. Um, related to everything that we're talking about, um, true or false, great wine is made in the vineyard. True, true. Right. Tell us a little bit about th how things are managed in the winery to maximize your thought process and that philosophy. Well, you know, I started using the term natural winemaking, you know, a number of years ago. And that, that term has been co-opted now by the unshaven and 
Bosch group who are too lazy to use sulfites to make a good wine. Um, but it's basically a minimal intervention. If, and our theory is if you've got great vineyards and you manage them well and you pick at the right time, the, the job in the cellar is a little bit more easy because you're going to have a, a better chance of having a healthy, successful fermentation if you're picking at sugars that are around 24 or between 23 and 25 as opposed to so much of the value that picks between 26 and 29. There's just so many more problems you can have when you pick at those sugar levels. And since we don't, we have, the process is actually very straightforward. It's very simple. Uh, there's always issues and it takes attention to detail and attention to, you know, cleanliness, which I'm, our previous uh, cellar master who left in 2015 used to describe himself as a glorified janitor. His job was just to keep it really clean down here and keep an eye on things. Um, so yeah, that's to me, that's a very natural process when you have healthy vineyards and you pick at the right time, the process is really straightforward. Right. And I, I think it's really important too, that you guys, you guys are more of the European model in that, you know, um, art is your cellar master and that's, that's the title you have for him, right? Yeah. There's, Chef de Cave. Yeah. Chef de Cave. Exactly. That's exactly how it's done in France. So, uh, a cooperage, you have a very determined cooperage program, um, and, 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 Complex, I almost think, a little bit. Tell us a little bit about what drives those decisions. Well, it's actually really simple. It's, I use this analogy all the time. It's salt in a soup. You know, most soups, if you don't use any salt, you're, you're going to be leaving some flavor behind. Salt is a wonderful flavor enhancer. But if you use too much salt and your soup tastes like salt, you, you've really failed. So we use that same sort of theory here. We use about 33% new wood on our on almost all of our wines uh, with the majority of it being French but some still being American with the the thought that we always want the oak influence to be a secondary characteristic of the wine never a primary characteristic again it's like salt in a soup it's enhancing uh, without ever being dominant or apparent so we, we rotate in new every year certain percentage and we rotate out old every year certain percentage and uh, we, we do rate them every year to, to dial in their, the nuances. That's probably the, I think the most difficult sensory analysis tasting we do all year long is the white barrel analysis tasting, especially on the French oak barrels, because you know, six months in barrel for our state Chardonnay with a French barrel and you're tasting 10 different barrels, the differences are extraordinarily minute and subtle. And we're tasting in front of our, or with our barrel suppliers, so nobody likes to look like an idiot in front of their peers. So you really kind of are on your game that day trying to, you know, make sure you can make some decent uh, guesses as to who's who and what's what. You know, that brings me to the next thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to work with you for, I think it's tw uh, 13 or 14 years, something like that, Michael. And I got to say, I've been, I've been at your, your table when you guys are tasting. And um, I, I think your palate of, uh, of, of how to, your ability to taste is a gift. I mean, I, I don't know anybody that I certainly can't taste the way you can taste. And um, how long did it take you to develop that? And is, do you think it's a gift or is it something you developed or is it a little bit of both? I mean, your, your ability to pick the smallest detail out of a wine is extraordinary. Well, I don't think it's a gift for one thing. I think it's more of a question of being able to pay attention to what's happening in your own body. It's more of a, a, a the result of concentration and focus and it is any, any special gift and then being comfortable with being able to express what you feel and not feel intimidated i mean I, i'm sure everyone who's watching has probably been in a wine group at some point and the same dynamic happens almost every time most people don't want to say a thing because they're worried about looking like a dumbass if they don't you know make the right call on a wine um so there's, there's a sense of you know they just don't trust themselves and i think as a result of my education from my father, I just grew up with wine as a more normal thing. So there never was a oh, wine's new to me. I got to figure this out. Um, it's just always been part of what I've done. And I think uh, my ability to concentrate is maybe is a little bit above average. So I've always been comfortable analyzing wine, talking about it, uh, and then making decisions and, and making wine, I think is a lot about making decisions in a timely manner. I mean, we could spend three times the amount of time, on blending trials and really split hairs and get crazy. Um, and I don't think we'd come up with a better wine. I think it's, it's just timely decision-making is it's crucial to coming up with a good product. 
Riley, are you following your dad's footsteps in this? You, do you have a pretty good um, sense of, uh, of uh, you know, your palate and how you can taste and identifying things the way he can? Yeah, I do. I've also found that when I taste in groups of my peers, people my age, it just helps to speak first. So you, so you establish yourself as the alpha in the tasting group. Therefore, even if what you're saying is wrong, uh, people will just take <laughs> believe it it's absolutely true uh so yeah speak first that's my best advice to anyone who's doing a tasting group and if they, they're feeling intimidated just get be the first one out there and people will follow you um and then but to answer more seriously uh i think i'm, I'm a little bit i think i'd probably side a little bit more with you or maybe a hybrid of both what my dad just explained and, and your question which is i think to a certain extent it's it's mostly a skill that you build and over practice um and over time but um I think it definitely helps to be born with a certain olfactory sense that you can then build upon. I, I definitely met people that um, have, have far less experience than say I do in wine and, and it just comes to them so naturally. It, it kind of just levels you when you meet people like that. Um, so I think, I think it's a blend of both, but um, I, think, I think anyone can become proficient in blind tasting and wine analysis just given enough time and practice and interest. Um, and of course money, it's very expensive to um to get to know wines because in order to get to know them you have to try them and uh, right. that's that's really the main the main um thing that inhibits people from really getting into it obviously is the financial thing which is why it's great to get into a group um pool your resources buy wine together taste wine together uh learn together it's kind of how you, how you do it right interesting uh okay switching gears we got it we're starting to run a little short on time here so um, let's go up to the winery and, and to uh, talk a little bit about marketing and sales. And you have two programs at Canaan. Um, you have a Napa program and a reserve program. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, those programs and the differences and uh, what you're after in terms of uh, helping people with their Canaan experience with those two programs. Sure. Well, it's really, uh, they, they essentially evolved. And again, it all, it all kind of goes back to the replanning of the, of the late 90s. Dad's goal from the beginning was to be an estate producer. You plant 43 out of 47 acres. And I came back in 98. I had to buy fruit to make wine because the estate production, we had one Merlot vineyard that was producing, and that was it. So, um, and that was the greatest contribution that Nils Venge has really uh, done or afforded for the winery. He was hired as the winemaker in 94. And having him... Um, and he knows, literally knows everybody in the Valley. Having him on the team when I came back as a guide to go get uh, purchased fruit was, was enormous. I got to meet so many growers and people that uh, Nils gave me access to. And from those, uh, those contracts, um, I decided to keep a couple. And that's sort of the genesis of the Napa line was it evolved out of that replanning process. Our goal, of course, was to get back to a state and that be our top tier. But at that point, I thought, it's, it's, why don't we continue having a second tier it's going to be Napa. It's going to be still a state driven, but we can still use, you know, Cabernet from the Pope Valley, which is such a great value. Um, Merlot from Carneros, which is a great value to, to make the Napa Merlot. So um, that's kind of the genesis of it. I think, I think it can be a little confusing at times, the Napa and the reserve, um, but the reserve wines are hundred percent of state, the finest example of each um, iteration that we can do with those wines. And the Napa wines are just damn good blends of the leftovers from the estate combining with these contracts that I kept from the replanting years to make a great value wine that's estate driven, but not a hundred percent estate. Um, so I want, I, one of the other things that, that I wanted to ask you about in every business, there's three core functions. There's operation operations, uh, there's finance and there's marketing and sales in your business. Which one is, do you feel um, is the most challenging? Sales. <laughs> well, I, I think of us as having four businesses wrapped into one. We have a farming operation that's number one and, and most important. Number two, we have a manufacturing operation. That's the winemaking, the seller. Uh, number three, we have a sales company, which you're part of, where we distribute the wines. And number four, uh, which is dormant right now, we have a hospitality company. So to me, finance is, <laughs> I hate to say it's irrelevant. <laughs> Because we, we basically fund ourselves. We don't have a line of credit or anything from a bank. We actually do make a little bit of money. We just fund everything with cash. So there is no accountant. We'd have an accountant, of course, to file taxes. But there is no 
you know, we can't do this because of budgetary restraints. We can do whatever we feel we need to do to make each part of that operation run the way we think it should run. But to address your question, and Riley already did quite directly, the hardest uh, part of this whole equation is sales. Right, right. Do you have any thoughts as to why that is? When you make like one of the greatest wines in the world, why, why is that difficult? Because there's so much product out there for the consumer to choose from. And there's so many marketing companies out there with larger budgets to dominate, you know, billboards, airwaves, TV waves, uh, restaurant promotions, retail promotions uh, that were literally, you know, outgunned by a lot of money from large corporations promoting their stuff, which might be nice, might be okay, probably not as distinct as what we do, but we're just simply outgunned. I mean, our, our marketing budget is Riley and I going to different markets and working with sales reps, doing sales meetings, doing wine dinners, doing, you know, in-store tastings. That, that's essentially our Interesting. We, uh, we, sorry, we had, just had a very loud motorcycle go by here. So uh, I apologize to anybody if you had to listen to that, unfortunately. What is, uh, tell me what your number one marketing tool is. Well, it's the wine itself. We just want to get the wine in people's hands. And we think that enough people will get it that they'll want to become regular purchasers of our wine. I mean, I just look at it very, very simply. Um, and say, now that the uh, we're all living through this pandemic, and it's um, it's obviously uh, not a lot of fun for any of us. I've always told our crew that one of the most important things we can do is stay relevant, and uh, relevant is really really important because there's a lot of things going on in a lot of people's lives. When you look at all the obstacles stacked up against you, um, the closure of restaurants, the distribution network majorly impacted. Um, the tasting room is closed. Are you managing to stay relevant and how are you doing it? Well, yes, we are. And um, by directly communicating with our email list, and our wine club members through you know, emails, videos, Facebook live chats, um, doing distributor meetings with different distributors, uh, doing tastings for retailers in Texas and country clubs in Kansas City and you know, it's, it's all through this medium now that we're able to uh, reach out to people and uh, keep ourselves front and center. Right. Um, and I, I want to say also real quickly for anybody that's uh, uh, listening here, um, you can always talk to your retailer about getting the wines. I think it's a really important thing. Um, go into your retailer and say, I would like to buy this wine. And um, the retailer's as a general rule, nobody that I know that's in, uh, in the wine business doesn't want to sell wine. So if you ask them for it, um, you know, they'll, they'll often try to look for it. If they can't, you can always go to keenanwinery.com and uh, we'll hopefully share the screen here uh, to show you the website in a second. But you can always go to keenanwinery.com and they've got all kinds of things also that, that might not be easy to find, such as, you know, things that are in the library and large format and things like that. So but always, always talk to your retailer. They can, uh, they're, they're really good at finding things. Um, and you know, but the winery is also a really, really good source as well. And, uh, I know for people like me that, that work out in the field, um, I feel like the winery is, uh, obviously the wines are important in marketing, but I always feel like the winery is one of the most important marketing tools too, because, um, the tasting room is where people make that connection. And when they make that connection, they, they stay with it. So really, really good stuff. Um, yeah, Laura got, Laura's our tasting room manager. She got pretty excited the other day when I said, you know, I'm thinking of keeping the tasting room closed. It's just so nice up here to have the place to ourselves. And she kind of freaked out a little bit. She goes, well, you know, one of the reasons we have a good mailing list is because of that tasting room. I'm like, don't worry. <laughs> I was kidding. I was kidding. Uh, that's funny. But uh, I can see how you took her right to the hoop. <laughs> um, Dan, would you like me to share the winery page now? Yeah, why don't you why don't you do that so everybody can see what the uh, uh, the website is and the uh, uh, you know you can always get in touch with the winery. I, I definitely encourage you to go visit too when 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 you can. Obviously, don't uh, uh, you don't want to go there uh, right now. But that's the uh, uh, the website, and obviously uh, you know you can find uh, a lot of information on there about uh, whatever you might be looking for and uh, and whatever you might be wanting to find. And again. Uh, also, you can uh, always talk to your retailer and and uh, ask them about uh, finding the wines for you. So, 
we covered a lot of ground here, and I do want to uh, to get to a, a time we can uh, turn it over and let anybody ask any questions they have. And of course, Michael, you've got a hard stop here shortly. So, is there anything that uh, that you wanted to add? Anything that I missed? Well, I can't see the questions now on the right that were there a second ago, but oh, they're there. Tokar said something that's really pertinent. She said, because she's answering the question that Debbie said, you know, do you anticipate the more better the Mencia for out of state distribution or only for club members? And Tokar says, it isn't likely those special wines will get off the mountain into main distribution for a while. Special requests sometimes speed up that process. So it's just like you're saying, um, if you're a friend of the program, you have access to everything we do. Those wines probably will not be in general distribution, but that doesn't mean you can't get them through distributor if they're special ordered. Right. Um, to get to wherever you're at or, or get them directly from us. So right. uh, ask away, ask man, ask Tokar or whoever your rep is and uh, we can make it happen. One thing I would also uh, say for the group, and again, you know, a lot of times we talk about things that uh, people here might not be watching, but people on the YouTube channel might see it. And that is that uh, the winery is unbelievably supportive of uh, everything that happens in the field. Uh, it's very unusual that the, the winery and Michael and Riley say, not interested, not gonna do that, whatever, you know, unless it's something really, really crazy. But they also commit, um, and again, it, you know, we're, at some point this whole thing is gonna end. Um, they also commit to uh, restaurants are universally supported because of the winery's core philosophy and belief that, you know, wine is on the dinner table and lunch, lunch table. So, uh, restaurants will always be able to have access to uh, things that they want to have and, and get on the list. So that's another place when you're out to eat. Um, if you don't see the wines, definitely ask for them because uh, they, they belong. They're, well, now we've got the, some sort of a, uh, an ambulance outside. It's just loud today. <laughs> Sorry. He wiped out. We hear a knock at the door. We'll be concerned. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anybody else? Anybody uh, have any thoughts, comments, questions? Our last uh, few minutes with these two. Hey, Ben. Yes. Um, I just wanted to show you guys what I'm drinking right now. Runner. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. Oh, hey, nice. Little well, tenure. Wine Cabernet Franc. Uh, I used to sell these wines when I was working in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Oh, okay. wow. How long, how long ago was that? I was there from 2013 to 2016. I worked for uh, Cask and Cork. Yeah, so did I meet you when I came out? And I think I came out in 2016. I don't remember, honestly, because, and I think I probably would have remembered. So I don't think, it must, you may have come right before I started. I lived there a year before I started working for him. So you were probably there in 2016 and I started in 2017. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just missed but you. But your uh, box Merlot was one of my favorite wines. So I'll, I'll need to be getting some more of that from you. Wonderful. How's the 09 drinking? It's really nice. Very, uh, very elegant, very soft flavors. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really good. I'm, I look, my mom is here and I looked at her and I said, Oh my God, I've drank half the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so I, gotta, I gotta slow down. Um, but yeah, I'm going to save, save the rest for my husband for later tonight, but it's, it's delicious. So I was very excited to open it tonight. Yeah, we had we had the uh, the 07 Cap Franc last weekend or the weekend before, and it was really it was beautiful, very pretty. It, it, it very very elegant style. I love it. Thank you, Michael and Riley. We have a question from Debbie Lawrence, who, by the way, is our uh, distributor partner in uh, in Rhode Island here, and she says the website says that you work sustainably. What does that look like uh, for your winery? Well, it's in reference to our vineyard practices, so. I can't remember who the governing group is, Napa Green or whatever. They set up a number of protocols for specifically mountain wineries to adopt to really prevent erosion. And uh, one of them is when we did the big replanting in, in the late 90s, we changed from a terrace system to um, when we pulled the vines out, we recontoured the hill smooth and planted the vines going straight down the hill and then had a, a water bar every, whatever, 20 paces at an angle that would if there was any surface runoff water, would take it into a tube underground to a filtration pond at the bottom. And uh, now we grow cover crop over the entire vineyard as well, and then mow that in the spring and let it self compost. And by doing these things, we really don't have any runoff now anyway. And if we did, it would still be trapped in these, this underground system. And that was the biggest part, was, uh, was really all about um, fish-friendly farming. 
uh, no runoff, keeping everything out of the creeks, that kind of thing. Yeah, we, we installed a, a fairly extensive uh, valve system with our uh, rainwater um, catchment system that essentially senses when it's raining and actuates the valve so that uh, the rainwater doesn't get diverted into our septic. And there's just a whole, whole process we were remodeling up here that was a part of that certification. Um, and, then, and then in that same vein, we're also 100% solar powered and have been since 07. Um, you guys actually don't need the county for anything, do you? We unfortunately, <laughs> just, I, I, despite all my fantasies of, of getting off the grid and, and isolating ourselves up here, by law in California, we cannot disconnect from the power grid despite uh, actually generating a surplus of power up here off our grid. Um, by law, and I think I think I got to the bottom of that. I think that's the, as a result of uh, safety issues with workers. And I think if you're if you're working on the line, based on your training, you're only supposed to expect power coming from one direction. And if a bunch of people, if the county were to let a bunch of people generate their own power willy nilly, um, line workers would have to worry about power coming back at them um, when they're working on lines. So. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of the way it works. We 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 wish we could disconnect, but uh, that's not that's not the case in Napa or, or anywhere in California. Right, uh, and Debbie, also I would I would tell you one other thing too. Um, when you turn the bottle around, and uh, well, I have one right here, um, and you look at the uh, um, the label on the back, it it's it's written it's typed in green. The font is in green, and. Um, that is uh, very. That is done on purpose, and it's actually uh, a really gr great selling point. It's been something that we're able to uh, to go into a lot of businesses and remind them that uh, Keenan Winery is a friend to the environment and a friend to um, their area. They're 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 friendly towards nature and everything else. They don't. They're not doing anything up there that uh, that Mother Nature would disapprove of. We never even yell at each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Why do I not believe that? <laughs> uh, okay, anybody else have any other thoughts, comments, questions? We got uh, Michael's going to bolt here in a couple of minutes. Did we do that good of a job? We were that thorough. We were so thorough that nobody has any questions. Well, they're all asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to thank you guys. I have to pop off and go on to Tracy's now, but it was good to see both of your faces. Good to see you. Right. Right. Just a beautiful beach scene behind you. Yeah. That's the beautiful Jersey Shore. That's beautiful. <laughs> so that's got to be a sunrise photo then, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And good to see both yeah. you guys. From, good to see both you guys again, too. Oh, All right. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> oh, Chris. Uh, good to see you again, and uh, only the second time with Michael, but uh, at any rate, hopefully we'll you get down there, uh, up to Rancho the Cucamonga? Yeah, Who's, oh, one, a few more years, maybe, you know, we'll see. And right on. See you guys again. All right. All right, gang, anything else? Anyone else have any, uh, any this, is your, uh, this is your opportunity for the next uh, five minutes. Yeah. By the way, I'm, uh, for anybody that uh, is curious, I am drinking the uh, the 2018 Chardonnay. Um, I told Michael and Riley that I did not have uh, any steak to go along with it. So, you know, but uh, it's it's absolutely tasty and delicious. Great job, guys. Good seeing you. Thanks, All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, we will check in with you soon. And everybody, have a great weekend. Enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. And hopefully you've all got nice weather out there. Hey, Michael. Hey, Woody. Hey, buddy. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Fantastic. It's good, good to see you. Sorry, I'm just, I'll start my video back up. Hey, how's it going, <laughs> Riley? I haven't met you before. What's going on, Woody? Nice, nice to meet you. Hey, just just want to say hello. Oh, I'm, I'm over in Mount Beter. I'm just a couple mountains down right now. Oh, right on. <laughs> uh, hey, Elizabeth. Hey. <laughs> Glad to see you guys are doing well. Just wanted to say hello before I got off. Oh, well, thank you. Good to see you, Woody. Likewise. Thank Take care. Nice to meet you, Riley. I'm assuming you're in North Carolina right now. Yes, yes, yes. How's the yeah. weather? Uh, we, we just had some tornado warnings and some storms earlier when the call first started, but um, it's it's – been interesting we haven't really seen normally by this time it's really hot and 
starting to get sticky, but it's been really nice and cool. So, um, but uh, restaurants just opened up at 50, or were able to open up at 50% capacity tonight. Um, and I'll tell you, man, the first two to three weeks were really rough when this whole thing went down. And, um, you know, from a distributor side, I'll, the last, I don't know, six weeks have just been rock and roll. Even we're 60% restaurant. Um, but we've adapted to how to sell, to, you know, during this whole thing. And we, we've done a really good job with it. And we're, we've been probably the last, like I said, six weeks, probably about 10% down. Wow. So, um, all things considered, it's been wow. phenomenal. We've adjusted some things and we're probably more profitable right now than we, we have been. So, um, you know, things are good. I'm glad, glad things are going well with you and um, look forward to getting to the other side of all of this for sure. Yeah. <laughs> right on, buddy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what about this How are, I have a question, like DTC side, what's it been like? Hold up there selling wine and do people come and pick up or are you shipping or? Uh, we're shipping quite a lot. Um, we're both doing deliveries. Riley's doing deliveries in Apple. I'm doing deliveries. Oh, cool. <laughs> people are coming up to pick up. I mean, people are dying to get out of their house. So they, they love oh, yeah. to up and, uh, pick up a case of wine. Yeah, so, good. Thankfully, our our sales have been uh, very, very strong. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. Very happy with that. That is good. It's definitely good. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up now, and I'm going to thank everybody for coming in, and uh, it was good to see uh, you guys, all of you, everybody. It's, uh, it's uh, what is this, like the ninth or tenth week? I think it's it's winding down, though. I know there's uh, a lot of people that are starting to open up, and I know uh, Rhode Island is going to pretty much be uh, almost all opened up here in the next uh, three or four weeks, so that's a good thing. But um, anyway... I will look forward to uh, to seeing uh, Riley and Michael. I'll look forward to seeing you and talking to you on the phone like I do uh, a couple times a week. And everybody else, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. And thanks again for coming on. See you, man. Thanks a lot. See thanks, you. Thanks, guys. See you, Mandy.